Welcome back. My name is Jim Caseman, and we're talking about how to get to know God intimately. And as I said before, I was taught in 1974 in Bible school that you needed to preach the whole counsel of God in order to really get to know God and have an intimate walk with Him. So I've been teaching since last August on all kinds of subjects from the Old and New Testament. And uh, this is the fourth time, fourth session on my testimony. And before that, we went on this for two or three weeks, I guess, talking about alcohol and, and, and drugs in the Bible. And I determined in all of those weeks not to express my own opinion or even to say that I was an alcoholic at one time. And so I uh, just, what does God say? What does God's word say? And that's what we stayed with. And so we concluded that back for about four sessions back. Number 415 was the end of that teaching, session 415. And since then, session 416, and today we're in session 419, uh, talking about my testimony. I'd left off talking about how I stopped at the treatment center on the way to hit the bridge the second time. And uh, they, I walked into the lobby and they had my keys before I knew it. So apparently the pastor had called ahead of time that there might be a man stopping by. And of course I did. So I was in, like I said in the last session, three weeks in the local hospital for, to be, for detox because they didn't have detox center set up in the treatment center yet. It was a new treatment center. Then I was transferred back. All right. Then we left off. I was released New Year's Day, January um, 1968. And then two couples, Paul Ettinger and, and Cleo Spetsos and his wife, they hooked up with us. And then I found out later, this is where I guess I left off, that they believed that if you could keep a man sober for 18 months, that uh, then he would, uh, his chances of staying sober for the rest of his life would really be great. And you know, I've thought about that since I've been a Christian. You know, you get people saved and really, instead of just, you know, you're on your own now, you ask Jesus to come in your heart, we really need to stay hooked up with them and work with them and nurture them, teach them the word. And if you can keep them walking with God for 18 months, their chances of staying with God are great. So, so I saw the same principle later. But meanwhile, I'm not a Christian at this point. I have not received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. This is only 1967. I didn't get born again until 1972. All right. So then, AA. And these two, I mean... Uh, Kathleen then, you know, in the treatment center, she came down and was involved in a couple of days, I guess. Uh, and she was taught that if Jim ever got stinky thinking, you know, get him in the car, drive the 114 miles one way and for outpatient counseling. So I guess, I don't know, we did a number of those trips. She'd say, stinky thinking, get in the car, outpatient counseling. Well, after a year or two of that, I don't know. Stinky thinking, hey, let's get going, heading for the treatment center. And I said, well, not me. I'm not going down there. And of course, she said, uh, well, I'm going to go. So Paul uh, and, and Cleo Splitzoser, that one couple, they took her down. And then Paul Ettinger worked for Fargo Manufacturing. And in those years, of course, he had a pickup, but we didn't have cell phones. But he had a huge antenna on his pickup and a great big box and whatever. And, of course, you know, had a telephone in the pickup. That was really, really, really high tech <laughs> in those days. He followed me everywhere I went that day. And I even went into a tavern, ordered a glass of 7-Up, and he's, he walked in and sat right alongside of me. So I never drank, but I was on what they call a dry drunk. But I didn't drink any alcohol, just 7-Up. So they came back from the treatment center, I guess it was about eight o'clock that night or so, and get and so Paul and his wife and Cleo and his wife were with Kathleen and I, I don't know, until two, three in the morning. And that was not uncommon. I'll tell you, in those years, you had a dime in your wallet. That's what it would call a dime for the payphone to call for help if you're getting stinky thinking. And uh, I, I'm serious. They, we could call at midnight and they'd show up in the house. I mean... It was really, really awesome. So they stuck with us. So then, I had a lot of things, of course. Uh, meanwhile, I ended up being company commander at a local guard unit and all that sort of stuff. Back to college, matter of fact, when I was released from the treatment center, 
uh, I was picked up. There was a, um, they would have a program for where they would uh, rehab, uh, rehab programs and where normally like they might send you to rehab for two years to learn to be an auto mechanic or something like that. And then they realized that I had gone to college for two years. And so they offered to pay for two years tuition for me to go back to college or the university. And so I already had failed some courses because of my drinking. And so I, I for, for two years, four qu quarters a year, all year round, and I'm taking overloads to make sure that I make up for the courses that I failed when I was drinking. And so I did graduate in 1970 uh, with my four-year degree. So that was awesome. And like I said, then I was company commander of the unit, and things are looking great. We're paying our bills, you know, a little here and a little there. We're at least current in all our bills. And, uh, and counseling, married counseling. We're working on our relationship. I'm staying sober and, and, and everything looking great. And wouldn't you know it, we come down to about, uh, let's see now, this would be um, the end of uh, May, April, the end of May. And uh, I, I guess it would have been the last Thursday of May then would have been, I suppose. And I decided, I mean, this is really crazy. I decided, and everything looks really good. But I thought, what is the use of staying sober? I thought to myself, I'm just just sure willpower is all it is to stay away from drinking. So then I decided I'd hit the bridge. And for the third time now, I'm heading for the bridge. So on that Thursday, I decided I would hit the bridge the following Thursday. Well, wouldn't you know it? I make the plans, getting all everything ready on, you know, immediately. Friday night, here people, my neighbors are knocking on the door. Their pastor told them, don't assume that everybody and your, that all your neighbors are born again, even if you know they go to a certain denomination and what have you. So with, I found out later with fear and trembling, they're knocking at my door. And because they'd never had a Bible study before, he worked for the Game and Fish. He was a housewife and um, they weren't in the pulpit ministry. But, but the pastor then gave them Campus Crusade material and to use. And wouldn't you know it, uh, they said, would you invite us to the Bible study on Tuesday night? the following Tuesday night, and I agreed to go, and you know, not because I felt I needed anything spiritual. I was just going to set those dumb church people straight about us AA people, Alcoholics Anonymous people, because we talked more about God than they did. Talk about arrogant and stupid. So I went to set them straight. But you know, when I walked into that home, I couldn't open my mouth. And they shared the gospel with the four spiritual laws. Then they asked, and 14 of us neighbors, by the way, showed up. 14. And all 14 of us wanted, they said, how many would like to ask Jesus to come into their heart after they shared the gospel with the four spiritual laws? 14 of us raised our hands. We all prayed that night to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Well, after we all prayed, they went around again, one by one. Did you pray the prayer, Jim? And when they got to me, did you pray the prayer? I said, yeah. Where's Jesus? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> no, nobody ever read the Bible to me at home or, or Bible stories or anything. I was totally ignorant in calling it spiritual things. So they explained it all over again. I guess the others needed to hear it too. And so my wife and I both asked Jesus to come in our heart that night, Kathleen and I, and we went home um, cold turkey. I mean, we didn't have any feelings, just by faith. And of course, the next day, Wednesday, by faith. And then, of course, Thursday morning, I'm going to hit, getting ready. I'm getting up. This is my day to go hit the bridge. I come into the kitchen. My, my wife's in the kitchen, and she didn't say good morning. She said, Jim, you're not cussing anymore. And when she said that, something inside of me stirred, and I knew Jesus was in my heart. How he got in here, I don't know, but he was in there, and I'd never take his name in vain again. Hallelujah! And from that point on, we began to read the Bible, and it was like Jesus talking to us and it's never stopped. It's been like that for me since 1972. It's like Jesus talking to me when I read the Bible. Glory be to Jesus. So that's one way for the major turnaround right there. So praise God. Well, praise the Lord. We'll just pick it up in the next session. Meanwhile, you just be blessed in everything that you set your hands to do. Amen. <laughs>